Hi, and welcome back to the Tokyo Show with your host, Nicholas Pettis. Today, we are going to do chapter four of the Blue-Eyed Samurai. Chapter four is called Starting My Training. So, that night we fell asleep early, and the next morning I woke up to the sound of the Uchideshi singing downstairs in the kitchen. I thought... So, welcome back to the... Shit. Hi, welcome back to the Tokyo Show with your host, Nicholas Pettis. Today, we are doing Chapter 4 of The Blue-Eyed Samurai. So, let's just get started. Chapter 4, Starting My Training. That night, we all fell asleep early, and the next morning, I woke up to the sound of the Uchideshi singing downstairs in the kitchen. I had thought that I would be put to training right away, or at least to do some chores... But as I was a month earlier than everyone else, they didn't know what to do with me, so they kind of just let me be on my own. Um, once they finished singing, one of the Uchideshi came running upstairs and told us to hurry up and come downstairs for breakfast. I got up remembering feeling cold. Ooh, yeah, it was really, really cold, actually. Um, and wondering why they didn't heat up the rooms. Uh, they didn't have heaters. Uh, they were very thin um, buildings, and so in the wintertime, it was super cold, and with the tiles on the top, on the roof in the summertime, it was extremely hot. And the mosquitoes, oh, don't let me get started on mosquitoes. Anyone, anyway, everybody just seemed to sleep in their clothes, but there's a reason for that. We'll get to that later. Once downstairs, I was directed to sit at the end of the table. Laigo tried to teach me how to say itadakimasu, which is what you say before you receive your food in Japan. Like this. You close your hands together and you go itadakimasu. It means uh, thank you for uh, giving us this food. Thank you for receiving the food kind of thing. It's a kind of blessing. The food consisted of a bowl of rice, a raw egg, some soup, and some kind of beans which looked and smelled like something I would rather not try to describe. <laughs> That's natto. I love natto now. I had never eaten a raw egg in my life, and all I could think of was Rocky when he starts gulping down those eggs in the Rocky movie. It was just ugh, really yucky. Um, and I was not about to start throwing up on the table right now. So I passed both the egg and the beans. Everybody else had finished their meal before I had decided what to do with the beans and eggs. And I hadn't even given a thought as to what kind of food I would be eating while living here. So that morning, I had a serious awakening. When LIGO pointed out to me that it was important to eat everything and not to have any rice grains left over, I knew I had been lucky the last night when we went to the restaurant. Because now I was stuck in the dorm and I would have to eat whatever I was given. That morning I had worn my jeans and a normal sweater, not realizing it had offended everybody. Judd told me to go upstairs and change into my tracksuit and wait to be cold. All I could say was, Oss! I was starting to get nervous about stepping on people's toes. This was a new country with a new customs. And it was another world within the world of a country. I wanted to do the right thing, but if no one told me, I wouldn't get to get it right. And everything I did was wrong in the beginning. That's just the way it is. Anyway, breakfast is at 8.15 every morning, and about 8.20, everybody is back at the dojo. Literally. It's like a three-minute breakfast. Gulp it in, sculp it in, and then it's straight back to the dojo to start cleaning. So everyone is dedicated to different areas of the dojo for cleaning. Um, this goes on until 9.28, uh, where they have the assemble for the morning ceremony, which begins at 9.30. The morning ceremony is a time where everyone working and living at Hombu got together to listen to whatever Soulside decided to talk about. I was sitting on my futon waiting to find out what was going to happen next when one of the Uchideshi came and told me to follow him. He took me right up to the dojo and had to line up in the back of everyone else. Then Laigo told me what was going to happen and I decided just to do the same as everybody else. As I was probably going to get nervous once Sosai walked in and then forget what to do. At exactly 9.30, the drum is beat three times, four beats. Doom, 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 like that. And uh, this announces that we are ready to start the, the chore, which they call it in Japanese. And then Sosai comes down from upstairs. We all got to do mokso, which we are standing mokso. I like that. We close our eyes for about 20 seconds. And then it's a big a bow and a big greeting to us with a, Os, Sosai! And that morning, uh, Sosai... Apparently didn't have much to say, so he was out of there within a few minutes. But sometimes he would be like just talking and talking and talking right up until 10 o'clock when the first class would start. And we would have to stand there not moving at all like this and listen to it. And it was um, fairly frustrating in the beginning because I didn't speak Japanese. But um, we had a, a translator. Uh, there was a girl that worked in the office that used to come over and tell us uh, what was going on at the end of it and what Sosai was talking about. 
Um, so that was really helpful. It was my first time inside the real dojo of Hombu, and I was totally blown away. It was so real and felt so full of, I don't know how you can describe it, but it felt so full of Sosai and a Kyokushin. It was like walking into a storybook, like walking into Kyokushin. The dojo itself, where I trained in Denmark, Denmark, was brand new and fully equipped to suit any martial artist. It was much bigger and had big weights room with heavy bags hanging there so you could just go and train whenever you wanted to. The floors were so soft that you could practice rolls and jumps and jumping kicks without hurting yourself. It was just beautiful. So you can imagine my first impression when I first walked into Hombu <clears throat> and saw that the paint was coming off in places. There were dogies hanging all over the place. Uh, outside Hombu, there were maybe 40 different dogies hanging on either side of the street so that you just didn't feel like, like when you walk into dojo, it's like you could smell the dojo. It was just like a complete different experience. The basement looked like some old kind of bunker with two uh, hanging bags that are almost like, you know, falling apart. Um, and the dormitory, I'll get back to that later. But all of this was a completely different level of like, like usedness, I would say. That's the only word I could say it. Like everything had been beaten and, and just, yeah, messed up until everything was falling apart. Um, but this was like walking into a piece of history. This was the place of champions, the place where Sosai taught his karate. Around the walls, there were pictures of different people who had some deeper meaning to Sosai. There were pictures of Sosai when he was young and lots of certificates of honor ranging from the former president of the United States of America to the head of the Olympic Committee. There was a picture of Sosai talking to Sean Connery taken when he taught him some karate while shooting on one of the James Bond movies on location in Japan. Yeah, that's really cool. Then there was a big drum that they used at the All Japan Tournament, which was like snared with real bearskin. Uh, rumor says that this is uh, Noro Sensei who used to go up in uh, Hokkaido and hunt bears that he had killed a bear with a knife and then he'd given the, uh, the skin to the drum there. I'm not sure if that's true though. But the place was boiling with testosterone and I stood there for the first time feeling like a little boy, like a skinny little boy that had just about to enter manhood. It was pretty amazing feeling, I'll tell you that. Once the ceremony was over, we all went back to the dormitory and Ligo told me that since the graduation ceremony of the last third year students, everybody had been sleeping more or less where they wanted. However, today was the day to move the third year students into their new rooms and I, helped to ha and I had to help organize and clean out the big room. Before the morning ceremony, I had changed into my only tracksuit and that was the one I had designed myself, riding Kyokushin all the way down my leg that I had plastered on it like that. Uh, one leg with a poor copy of a kanji that I had kind of like carved out myself. I figured that since it was all Kyokushin, I would be alright wearing it. But first things first, I badly needed a haircut, a real Uchideshi haircut. Fortunately, there was a pair of clippers that were frequently used by the Uchideshi and Shian Butz said he wanted to be the honor of the first clip. Before I knew it, I had lost most of my hair. It wasn't the first time uh, for me to be, have, for have a shaved head and I felt quite good about it. Although I'm not quite sure what I look like. If you look at the photo, you'll know why. It was just weird. It was a weird look for me being so skinny and so like bald. Anyway. We all spent that rest of the morning cleaning and then after lunch, which was really good, Shian Boots came and asked if I wanted to go for a run. He wanted me uh, to show me his old running route um, while he was living in Japan. I got my things together and our, on our way to the dojo, we happened to bump into LIGO. He wanted to know where we were going and finding out, asked if he could join us. Once we were all ready, Shian Boots took the lead. I was used to running every day and I hadn't done anything but eat and sleep since getting off the plane. I was ready to take off, but Shihan didn't want to run very fast. So I had to rein myself in and try to listen to the conversation going on between Shihan and Ligo. <clears throat> After a while, I can't say how long, we came to a very steep hill and this was where Shihan Boots used to do his sprints while preparing for his third Dan test. The hill was so steep and curved that I was no, sure no cars would be driving up unless it was absolutely had to. He and Ligo and me line up and then he sent us off. I'm not about to lose the very first chance I was given to challenge one of my senpai. I'm sure he also wanted to see what I was made of, so we took off like there was no tomorrow. I just beat him but tried not to show it too much when Shihan came up after us. After that, I was pumped and ready to go. I could barely keep my feet on the ground. Shihan Boots and, and Ligo kept talking and I would run up to the next quarter and then wait for them. This went on for some time until suddenly I turned around and they were nowhere to be seen. I turned back and ran around looking for them without any luck. I thought I had a pretty good idea of where Hombu was and decided that they were playing a trick on me, so I might as well head back to Hombu. It's true. I was like so excited. I just had to run, 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 and I couldn't keep up with their pace because I felt like I just needed to fly. Um, but yeah, they turned a corner and uh, left me or kind of ditched me. 
Without too much trouble, I found my way back to Hombu and also the two guys sitting in front of Hombu laughing at me. Don't ever run in front of your senpai, said Jian Boots. You're the one, you're in for a lot of more trouble than just having to find your way back to Hombu. And that is actually a really good piece of advice here. There are times when you can challenge your senpai, uh, but running uh, in front of your senpai is actually not the chance to do that. So I don't suggest you guys do it. Anyway, at first I was quite sure he was serious or not, but the look at his face told me more than to ask him. All I could do answer him was, Os! And that means you pretty much just take it. That night, all the Uchideshi got together and talked about karate and whatever we all, wherever we were all from. I'd never been to Australia and had always been interested in what kind of place it was, so I wanted to know about the animals and the different things that I found interesting. Although that night went by pretty, pretty quick, I got the feeling that we would all be telling the same stories over and over to each other. Uh, the next uh, day, everyone got up mo for morning training at about 6 a.m. and they told me to sleep in. I was actually re relieved. I didn't sleep much after that, but I had some time to lie in my bed and enjoy a, mo a moment of utter silence. It was Xi'an's last day with us, and so he invited me out for a real breakfast after the morning ceremony. I hadn't been able to eat much of what they had served, and so the cook had gotten angry with me and told me off in Japanese. Like, seriously? raw eggs and natto and it's like miso soup and rice it's like i really didn't know what to do with it um but i hadn't understood a word of what she said afterwards judd told me not to worry too much as long as i didn't upset her too much or too often so i wouldn't get to hear any of it i was later to find out that she used to write down everything in her diary and had regular meetings with Sosa about how his boys were doing yeah she was really checking up on us yeah, since, um, anyway, Shihan said he would take me out for his really good breakfast, so I was hoping that it would be some bread or something. But he took me to the place called Yoshino Gyudon, and that's just the Gyudon, Yoshinoya. Yeah, it's the beef bowl, I think you know it. It's a rice with some, you know, shredded beef on top, and then you can crack an egg on top and eat it too. Uh, which in Japanese dishes, but nothing you could do recommend too highly. It's very cheap, and they are open 24 hours, so you can go there anytime you like and get a bowl of rice with some strips of beef and maybe a raw egg on top. I was not prepared for another raw egg and more rice, so although Xi'an was paying, I declined, telling him that I'd had enough of breakfast. At the same time, I was also trying to convince myself that I had to get used to the food here or I would go hungry. It's true, I had to force myself to eat that food. Xi'an had an early flight, so after eating, we sat down and had a small talk before I helped him over to the bus going to the airport. As no one could understand us speaking in Danish, we could have talked about anything, but Xi'an Boots wanted to take his last chance to talk to me about his different impressions. In the end, he gave me one final advice, which was, follow the Japanese. Whatever you do, do not become like the other foreign uchideshi. You have to follow the Japanese way. At the time, I didn't really know what he was trying to tell me, but then he said, do as the Japanese do. Don't ever question why or what. Always answer with a clear us. And don't forget that the reputation of Danish Kyokushin is riding on your shoulders. Do well, and you will honor us, not take from me, uh, not just for me, but for all of us. Do your best and make us all proud. Those were pretty heavy words, and um, they, kept, they really stuck with me for a long, long time. So... Um, I'm actually glad that he gave me that advice. He then hugged me and I felt sad that he was going. Uh, I almost felt left behind, but that only lasted as long as it took him for him to get onto the bus. Then I was full of, well, I don't know quite how to say it, but it felt like life had really finally begun for me. I was on my own. That was awesome. Walking back to the dojo, I had one of those golden moments in my life when I felt alive. You know, there are some times when you feel more awake than at other times, when you feel like the sun touching your skin is different from any other day. The wind in your hail feels different. Well, anyway, I felt like walking back on the, uh, to the dormitory, though I had a rude awakening when I got back there. Now my branch chief had gone and there was no one to look after me anymore, which meant that my senpai could treat me any way they wanted to. Ooh, yeah, this is actually uh, this is practically pretty scary of thought. As I said before, I had shown up almost one month early. This was because the secretary had mixed up the dates for the starting and finishing of the Uchideshi program. This meant that no one really knew what to do with me. They couldn't really start me on doing any chores and they couldn't have me join the training as the first official class was to be with Sosai. So I got stuck in the big room where I couldn't do really anything but just sit there and wait. And waited and wanted to train so badly that every time I could hear the kiais, I could start. Uh, I would start pacing around the room. During my day, uh, with the Japanese senpai would come in and fall on the floor just about anywhere they would fit and sleep they wouldn't get much rest because the intercom would always ring downstairs and they have to run down and answer it then they'd be off to doing whatever it was they were needed for foreigners were forbidden to answer the intercom uh, because sometimes it had soul calling and if we didn't understand what he said we would be in trouble and it was like this 
right? And then it's like, oops, run up and sprint down there. You had like three seconds to pick it up. Oops, sis, us, like that and pick up the intercom. Uh, eventually, when I was speaking good enough Japanese, I would uh, be able to pick it up though. I sat there for about two days watching everybody running in and out of the room and going off to doing whatever it was they were doing. I needed to work out so badly that I was just about willing to do anything. So I asked Ligo. He spoke Japanese to some extent and he was my senior by one year, which meant he'd stayed, we stayed in the same room. If I, he would ask the dormitory chief, uh, Minami Senpai, if I could train in the afternoon class. Ligo agreed that it was definitely wasting my time, so he asked the dormitory chief, Minami Senpai, who was a kind guy and if you didn't know him, wouldn't be able to look you straight in the eye. Um, not because he would have anything against you, but just because he was such a shy person. Like, really, he would never look you in the face. It was like you'd be talking to you and he'd be looking at your shoulder or he'd be looking at your chest or whatever. It was a really short little guy. Uh, super nice, though. Uh, he was about 165 centimeters tall and weighs about 83 to 84 kilos, which made him a little stocky short guy. <laughs> Uh, he used to train like no one I've ever seen before. He would spend hours and hours hitting the bag, but it still wouldn't do anything to better his technique. I swear, his technique was unfortunately like probably one of the worst ever, but he really, really, really loved karate. Sosa used to yell at him in front of everybody during the black belt classes because he couldn't kick high enough or because he, wouldn't, or because he would be too slow. But despite this, he had a very open heart and a true love for Kyokushin Karate that you rarely see in people. You could just tell that being the chief of the Wakaji Shiryo made him feel like he was fulfilling his dreams at a karateka. And it's true. He loved karate. He loved living in the dormitory. As my senpai and graduating almost 10 years before me, I could feel nothing but respect for what he had accomplished. I remember thinking what it must be like to be able to live in a dormitory when you really like doing it. Anyway, his reply was that I could join the general class, but not any of the classes Sosai taught until the other Uchideshi had arrived. So that very afternoon, I put on my dogi for the first time since coming to Japan. It was required of the third year students to teach the classes that they didn't have a proper instructor for. So once you had received your black belt, you were required to teach a fair number of classes per day and also training the existing classes with Sosai. We had one specific Uchideshi class on Thursdays, which Sosai taught for just the first and second year Uchideshi. Um, I ended up training in, in, training in that class for two years. And then the last year I was teaching that class when Sosa would come down and supervise it. Uh, then Friday night, there was a class with uh, black belts and brown belts that I also uh, ended up training in um, from since I was a yellow belt, I think. And then on Saturday, there was a two-hour class where it was called the Hoshukai, which was a class for anyone, open for any branch. Anyone could just come and, and join into Sosa's class. And then on Sundays, uh, I think it was 3.30 or it was 3 to 4.30, an hour and a half class with Solsai again. So there were four days in a row where Solsai was teaching. Yeah. Um, this meant that your first year uh, didn't have all that much training, but there was lots of work and different chores. Second years had fewer chores and a bit more training. Finally, in your third year, you would have all the training you could ever wish for. Anywhere, uh, that's what it looked like for the Japanese. Being a foreigner meant that as you weren't able to speak the language, there were things you simply couldn't do, like answering the interphone or standing in the lobby and helping out there. Occasionally, late at night, some senpai would show up and train, and if you couldn't speak the language, you couldn't assist them either. It was a constant reminder that you were just a foreigner and not qualified enough to do the same as the Japanese. I hated it. I hated this, like, you can't do it because you can't speak the, the language. So I decided to learn to speak their language and do my best to understand their customs. That afternoon, Mokoram was going to teach the class. He spoke Japanese like a native and he had taught a good, strong class with lots of kiais. I love being able to join in with everyone and just feel the kihon flowing through my body. All the foreigners from the dormitory showed up for the class mainly because they wanted to check me out and see what I could do. I learned later that it was sort of one of the things that other foreigners do to other foreigners at training at Hombu. It was like an initiation thing that you had to endure. Depending on how well you did, would determine your place among the foreigners. <laughs> uh, this is so old school. Well, the class started. It was a good class with a powerful kiai running through the dojo, quite unlike anything I was used to back home. I don't know why. Uh, it's not that people back home didn't do kiai, but it just sounds different in Japanese, and therefore it felt different. I was there doing my first class in Hombu Dojo and enjoyed every bit of it. After a good 45 minutes of basics, we went on to do Ido Geiko, which is basics under moving, and this lasted for another 45 minutes. I was still pumping and excited just being able to train at Hombu with Sosai sitting just upstairs listening to everything we did. And that made you Kiai a little bit more, I guarantee it. Then came the sparring, and I could feel the tension build. The other senpai from the dormitory were looking at each other and throwing me sideways looks. 
Oh yeah, I knew something was coming. Like they knew something I didn't. I didn't know what was coming, but it was about to find out. I was about to find out why I had come halfway across the world to become strong in karate. I can't remember whom I sparred with first, but I do remember that I kicked Lago in the mouth and that he turned away and checked his wounds in the mirror. He got a tiny little cut from being kicked in the face from me and uh, he was like, oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, I got to check this over here in the mirror. Um, and for, uh, where are we then? Uh, for that alone, I would receive punishment, by the way. Um, which I had no clue of why. When it came to Judge's turn, all hell just broke loose. He was going to show me who was the boss around here. And yes, he was most definitely the boss that day. Judd beat the crap out of me and he was strong, strong, strong. Man, he was a scary guy to spar with. Anyway, I don't know how long it lasted, but by the end of it, I couldn't walk. And even standing was almost impossible. He low kicked the crap out of me. Man, I don't think I'd ever been kicked that hard in low kicks ever. Uh, he had proven his point, and uh, he'd also given me a lesson that day. That's like, okay, man, I'm your senpai. You're just going to have to know who's the boss around here. That day, I swore that I would beat him one day. To myself, that is. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Uh, who really gained the most from that experience? Him feeling like the king by putting a new face on the floor or me for never forgetting or never forgiving him? <laughs> Actually, I'm going to pause a little bit here and go off script. The thing is, if you don't have good training partners and if you don't have someone that's able to push you hard enough to get and you know to force yourself to get better you're never going to get better and judd was just in a position of being a senpai and he was just proven a point we didn't really know each other at the point at that time so um i could be like i can like think back on it and feel uh that i got beaten and i feel it's unfair and feel all these many different feelings but at the end of the day we lived one year together just me and him when he was in his third year and i was in my second year and it was just the two of us for like eight months there were no other foreigners in the in the dojo at all and we really really grew uh, a bond that even today is like we're brothers for life um and he actually taught me so many things about fighting. He taught me how to get better. He taught me um, unwavering spirit. So, you know, for me, that one lesson in that first sparring session was probably more valuable for, than, than it was for him um, because it made me, like, deeply, rootedly wanting to get better and stronger. And um, that just takes dedication. So uh, I just want to say thank you, Judd, for that. Yeah. Anyway, after that, I had a really bad day. I tried to cover it up once back in a dorm, uh, but there are these really steep, steep, steep steps that leads up to the big room um, where we were first bunked up on. And I have to admit, it was the first time in my life that I'd had such a bruised leg. I remember crawling up those stairs like a lizard. <laughs> I literally couldn't climb the stairs. I had to crawl up with him using my hands and everything. Anyway, by the time we had had our meal and we're all lying down talking, I had almost forgotten about the afternoon's class. The next morning, I thanked, I thanked just about any, anything there was to thank for the fact that I was uh, told to stay in bed in the morning training because I couldn't get up from the floor. Oh, this being sleeping on futons and everything, it was like, you know what? My leg was so badly bruised, I couldn't even bend it. And then it's like, you know, Nick, you just stay in bed. It's like, don't worry about it. You're not a real uchi dish yet, you know? I was just like, thank God. Anyway, I spent a good 20 minutes working out uh, a comfortable way of getting to the toilet that morning. Uh, as the change of diet was taking its toll, I was getting a runny stomach and I needed to go to the toilet, but I couldn't squat down. <laughs> Oh, I tell you guys, it's like, um, this is the end of the chapter, but it's like this, right? I was bruised my leg so badly that I couldn't squat down. Um, and there's no toilet that you could sit on. So, and you're in this tiny little room, right? And I'd like kind of had to put my hands on these small ledges, right? And just like put my feet up against the wall like that. And then kind of halfway squat down and then just pray to God that I would actually not miss the toilet. Oh man, those were the days. Anyway, guys, uh, thank you very much for uh, listening to Chapter 4. Uh, we'll be back again next time. <laughs>